My name is Yara Khouri, and I have with me today Lara Bal'a. Bal'a is a designer, writer, and lecturer. Her writing is focused on Arabic print and visual culture. Her practice revolves around editorial design and multilingual reading experiences, while her teaching encompasses information studies, design history, typography, and communication design courses. Lara is the author of the monograph Emil Menan, Invigorating Arab Journalism Through Graphic Design, which was published by Hut Books in 2019. She is the co-founder of Majun Design Studio between 2010 and 2018, which serviced a portfolio of local and regional clients in the publishing, cultural, and non-profit sectors, including Hachet Antoine, Disney Middle East, Ibraz, Shams, which is the Sunflower Theater, Oman, Documentation and Research, Kafa, Enough Violence and Exploitation, and Médecins Sans Frontières. She has taught at several universities in Lebanon and in New Jersey, and is now teaching at the School of Architecture and Design at the American University of Beirut. She holds a Bachelor in Graphic Design from AUB in Lebanon, which she got in 2002, and a Master's in International Communication Management from the Hague University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands back in 2009. She is currently a PhD candidate at the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University in New Jersey, where she studies contemporary practices of Arabic calligraphy. Hello, Lara. Hi. Let's start with the first question. When and why did you decide to become a graphic designer? I think I decided in stages, or maybe it came to me in stages. So when I was going to university at the beginning, I knew I wanted to go to AUB because that's where my friends were going. And I remember taking the catalog and like going by elimination. And then this thing called graphic design remained. And somebody said, you like drawing, graphic design has drawing. Why don't you try that? So I tried that. And I remember the first year was really, really hard. And I wanted to quit after the first year. I went back home and my sister had her friend over and they said, you know, it's so nice to do something that you can see. Um, as opposed to work on Excel sheets that go into some drawers because both of them were bankers. And I think that stuck, so I tried again. And um, at some point when I went to do my master's, I was going more into like the communication side of design and thinking that I would go more into strategy and so on. But I went to do that in Holland, and Holland is, of course, known for all the beautiful designs that they produced. So I kind of came back to it. More recently, I went to do my PhD. And again, I found myself researching design through the PhD. So it, I keep coming back to it. It's sort of my home decision somehow. Mm -hmm. So when you first entered graphic design, you did not think, you did not think of the end product. What, what career, what did you imagine what you would do? Did you know? I had, I had no idea. And I think I only really started to understand what it's about in the second year when we started doing like identity or publication and stuff. And I started like the first year was much more abstract with basic design. It was all of this problem solution that I think I couldn't really envision where, where, where we were going with that. And how did your education inform your career so far in that sense? I think like AUB particularly helped me understand design as a language. Uh, mm -hmm. So like a lot of time, I mean, we know that design is in a lot of way a communication tool, tool for the corporate world, but design in AUB also, like AUB has these courses like designer in the community or like they encourage you to think of it as a medium that could also be subversive in like the corporate culture. Um, so I think that stayed with me uh, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And then probably other education experiences stayed with me as well. So my first, first work experience was in, was in advertising. Mm -hmm. And I started my career with Mehmet Gogeli and Mather, who have this brilliant program that they do every four years. That's like an induction program for designers, illustrators, people who do marketing and copywriters, and we all go there together. It helped me understand advertise, like advertising in the big school, like mm -hmm. what are we doing? And that's very different from a lot of people's experiences who go into advertising and start working on these like layouts and never understanding what they were really doing. So I think 
relating graphic design to storytelling and understanding how concepts can move on to different media from radio to print to video also stayed with me, uh, mm. the versatility of design. That's what got you um, into the master's, right? I don't know if that really got me into my master's. Maybe because like I was trying to think of like strategy and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, definitely. The and then in, part. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and more like how design is an instrument in a way. Like how you just, I think what I wanted to do was be able to not only be on the designer end, which is very you know, powerful, but sometimes uh, the power of designers is lost in the corporate world because people think that we come last minute and we don't help shape strategy and we don't help think of what and why communication is about. Yeah. So I was hoping to nurture that side more so that I could come into the process earlier. Mm -hmm. And did this translate in your work with your professional clients? I mean, did you make sure that they understood at what stage your work starts and you're not just the one decorating or doing the cherry on top, let's say. I think, I, I think it, it really had an effect um, because when I, I mean, when I started Majun after that, I remember when we were in meetings with clients, uh, being familiar with the vocabulary, mm. like the business vocabulary or like, Talking to them in their language will somehow bring more trust to the relationship. And I think it also helped me filter the clients who didn't really know what they were doing because I would ask questions that became disturbing for them and then somehow they would never come back. So it also, it, I think it functioned both ways in establishing trust and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why are you doing the PhD? Why did you take it further? What, wasn't the master's enough? I think my in, in my entire background prior to my master's, I was enjoying much more the hands-on work and the design um, than like the reading or the research. And I think that's not because I didn't enjoy the sport, but because I wasn't taught how to enjoy the sport. And my master's really, I had this amazing teacher who like made kind of a pathway for like what research is and like how to write. And I, mm. I remember being very taken by that and like discovering that, you know, like who said that I didn't like research mm. or who said that I didn't like writing or reading. Um, so I kind of had the seed of like maybe continuing with this at some point. But I think it came to me much more when I started teaching and when I was teaching at the Beirut Arab University, I think between 2016 and 2018, I started to teach like history and theory courses for the first time. And I really, I remember being really upset by this like binary of like where knowledge is produced and where it's consumed. And I remember like bringing all of these books that were written in the U.S. or in Europe and bringing them to my students. And my students in BAU are like a little bit of a different, they're from a different background than the mm. students that you would have in AUB, for instance. So they're not as global uh, in some ways. And and so that, that difference between these two worlds became bigger. I I just wanted to be participating in the making. And I remember feeling that if I really wanted to take myself seriously and transmitting this information, then I also need to be producing this information. Even if they were not global, I think there's a certain advantage to that also. Did you find a certain advantage with the uh, students at the Beirut Arab University? Definitely. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the main, I think one of the main value was also like taking me out of my bubble like mm -hmm. knowing that what matters to me or what mattered to me as an AUB student is not the same as what matters to them so also how to make the things that excite me communicable to people who are coming from a different um, environment and it, it's not it's not that hard but it's I think finding uh, the, the commonalities rather than taking things for granted. Mm -hmm. And did you find uh, resources when you were teaching the theory and history of graphic design? Did you find the proper resources 
Was it hard? Of course, it's hard, but I mean, the storyline was hard. probably yeah. in 2016 and 2018. The the history of graphic design by Bahia and Haysam was not out by then. It was not so out, well, so you didn't have any but, reference. So you were actually building your own story, or how did it? That- so so I went. It was the first time I teach it, and mm-hmm. what I did is just take the Eskinson textbook and uh, follow that, mm-hmm. um, and then. I tried to incorporate the local parts more. And I mean, we did have some of the book. We had your book, um, the Nasri Khattar book that my students read. We had Helmi Tuni book. So the, some of these were there and mm. students were reading them and presenting them. And then um, I also encouraged them to go visit studios and ask what current designers are doing. So we tried to bend bridges between what we were seeing and reading locally and like what we were reading and seeing and like the international slash U.S. survey. What is it that inspired you along your professional experience? People or incidents or objects or? I think it's always been people somehow. So like maybe teachers, um, Muhammad Dawas, who taught me uh, in basic design, his his way of seeing things stayed with me. I remember in the history book, in the history course that Zena Maas, she taught us, we learned about Tibor Kahneman's work. Mm-hmm. And I remember being really inspired by that. Uh, like Colors Magazine or like also like the, I think the designer as a social agitator somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in real life, when I wrote the book about Emil, um, he became sort of a big inspiration for me with what he stands for. And sometimes like just stories of people, you know, be it in fiction or things that we see on television. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what is the latest thing you saw on television? I have to admit that I don't watch a lot of TV. Yes. <laughs> I think the last, uh, the last, Probably the last television show that I saw and enjoyed was a series called The Modern Law, which is based off this New York uh, Times column. And uh, they also have it in podcast form. Mm-hmm. And they're like short personal essays that I really like. I'll keep a mental note of that. So since you're doing your PhD, you probably are reading a lot of books too. The thing about PhDs, which is sad, is that you're not reading books as much as you're using them. So you're like kind of strategically picking things. Um, and I think the last one that hit was this, um, I'm going to forget the name of the person now, Diane Shokun, okay. maybe. Um, but they were writing, because I'm reading, I'm, I'm, my PhD is about contemporary practices of calligraphy. So I've been thinking a lot about like the links between the visit, like the letter form and language and identity. And um, this book is about the Arabic language academies, which mm-hmm. where you're, you're familiar with mm-hmm. and like the, their discourse. And I, I think I really like the way they, the way he talked about language as like a proxy for identity and culture and all of that. Mm-hmm. How do you s- describe your specialization? First, how do you describe yourself? What are you specialized in? What is your focus in design or writing or research? Or I think I, so this is like not long ago, I was struggling with this question. And um, this is why, like when, when these things, like I, I, when I rewrote my biography the last time, which is what you started uh, with, I started to just say, to, to describe myself along three lines. So now I say I'm an editorial designer, a writer, and a lecturer because I do these three things and I think they complement each other in a way. Now, what this also means is that I live between these three things as opposed to living in one of them, which is like maybe the opposite of specialization. Um, but I'm really trying to endorse this role of like, building connections between different worlds so aren't like we all the... yeah aren't we all a jack of all trades we're becoming sort of a lot of circles that are uh, what do you call it uh, yeah like the venn diagram yes exactly yes it it, it, yes. it looks to me like this that all of the designers are trying to also find a way to bring all of this history um the theory 
the practice, yeah. everything yeah. that we're doing, we're trying to talk about it also, we're trying to teach it, we're trying to implement it in our design. So there's a lot of overlap between these things, yeah. right? Yeah, I think people, when, when people talk about information as a shield, they talk about it as a meta shield. And I think design is also a meta shield that could shelter into different places. Mm -hmm. And and like that also is, is in, I mean, people disagree or like argue about what the meaning of creativity is. And one of my favorite definitions of creativity is building connections. And mm -hmm. so I think when you embrace your role as a designer, as someone who brings connection, builds connections, then I think you're happier with being this high sun in between different fields or environment. Mm. And what, what makes you gravitate towards editorial design, which I'm personally am interested in? I think this is a, this is, this might sound funny, but I, I find it difficult to read. And I know that for someone who's doing a PhD, this could sound um, like a little bit of a contradiction, but I do have difficulty in maintaining focus with reading for a long time. And I think the way this has affected me as a reader is that I really like the material that I'm reading to mm -hmm. really be well, you know, well organized, to know where my eyes should go on a page. And especially in an environment like ours, where a lot of times we're, you know, seeing different languages at the same time on a page. I think that my... what draw me to it is trying to give myself this experience of an easy meeting. Um, mm. So I want the typography to be easily read and I want the, you know, wide spaces to be balanced and all of these things. Um, Are you thinking of uh, the editorial magazine that you designed in Holland? The North, was it called? Oh, North. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So this was like a group work of sorts and I think we allowed ourselves to I mean it, it was like designed to be like obviously a good reading experience or an easy reading experience but it was also how do I say this like it, we were not trying to be seamless about the marriage of Arabic and and uh, English like mm. in the contrary I remember we had like all of these lines crossing the layout saying when you're done here go read here so I think it was kind of experimental. Yeah, yeah. Like having that organization layer be in your face rather than mm -hmm. implicit in the reading mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. When your aunt asks you, Lara, what do you do? <laughs> what do you tell her? So I, I think when I was doing design work, like prior to... Um, going to the PhD, I was more like relating things to product. So like saying I'm designing books or posters um, because that makes it easy. Nowadays, I think I answer more in relation to like a social function. So I'm like mm. a student or a teacher. And I feel like that is then easier for people to understand than freelance work. Um, because, yeah, I mean, we're just trained to think of employment somehow mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you decided to do your phd do you see yourself continuing in education and academia i started my phd thinking that i wanted to go into academia and i still do um but i also think i've developed more of an affinity for research um so in a way, I'm also happy to be doing like curatorial work or like um, archival research or so I'm not. Yeah, I think I'm not really good at thinking of future directions, but mm. I, it's just to say that I'm like, like I, I want to continue in academia, but I also you want to have a foot in design only to that. If you uh, think back towards all the projects that you've done, what is the project that you are most proud of? I think that would be the the book, uh, the one on Emil Menheim. It's called the Invigorating Arab Journalism Through Design. So this is, as probably our listeners well know, part of the Khat series um, that uh, that is called Arab Design Library. Mm. And I really like the premise of these books because they put designers 
they assign designers to write about other designers. So it's sort of a generation and continuity of sorts. And for me personally, doing this type of work, you know, when when Huda approached me, I I hadn't written uh, about design before. Um, and so it was kind of a big challenge for me um, how to approach this. Yeah, so there's like a work of curation it. and a work of uh, like assembling the material, thinking of them in terms of themes, how to present them. And especially when you're trying to present the work of someone that you're very fond of, you also want to do justice to their work. Exactly. Um, so the novelty of of that experience, I think, uh, makes me proud that I was able to pull it off in ways that I hope do Emin's uh, trajectory justice. Mm -hmm. And how did you give him justice? Do you think, what, what, how did you write about his work? Because nobody had heard, I mean, not nobody, but very few people have heard of Emil's work. What we yes. have seen a lot of his work. But yes. we haven't, we don't know who is the hero behind them. So yes. I mean, it must have been quite but, a challenge to bring it all together. So I think that is in big part due to who he is as a person. So he's a very, I don't want to say humble person, but he is very much uh, like someone who believes in the collective. So like he does this work. And he always said that like the design work that he does is him participating in the cultural life of the city as opposed to, you know, designing particular projects or objects. And so he so, comes yeah, from so a certain he, generation of designers also. I mean, he comes from where they have been working together on so many collective projects and having the same yes. a school of thought, sort of. Yes, right? yes, definitely. The, the definitely. context in so, which they were working made them colleagues, yeah. professionals, and, and, and the, I, I feel, at least in their generation, the multidisciplinarity was very strong. Yes. No? Yes. Yes. And in big part, that's because like design as a profession was still not there in terms mm. of like uh, university programs. So they all became designers. They uh, wanted to socially so engage through it. You feel that yes. the impetus yes. for the design was social engagement, while yes. now it is the other way around where designers, and then we want to be socially engaged. Yes, it, exactly. It, it yes. came from within at the time, I feel. All, all, those, That's all that true. generation of designers, I feel, share this sort of uh, uh, experience. Definitely, definitely. Mm. Yeah, so like his, his design work, stemmed out of his political engagement and um but he did study he did st like he did study fine art so like he was close to the visual world but um also like having a graphic eye is not something that all painters or uh, fine artists have mm -hmm. um but i think what we most know I, and and you you started by saying that we know a lot of his work but we don't necessarily know he's behind it and one of his most known work was uh, an akhbar newspaper and i do remember that when al akhbar came out it like it was it shook almost us. like a revolution yeah it, it shook us like i was friend. The yeah, white spaces was... inside inside that like that newspaper was were amazing i thought that must have been very um, courageous of the news, the editors and the owners yeah. and the designers. Yeah. And I think yeah. uh, you, you explain in the book that relationship between yeah. the owners uh, of Al-Akbar, the late Joseph owners, uh, yeah. Joseph Smeha, and, uh, and him and how they had the same vision. So that was a quite a yeah. lucky stroke, uh, strike or stroke. Yeah. And and you mentioned earlier about the relationship of people together and how that was the impetus for work. Like also Joseph and Emil had worked together in the beginning of the 80s on another uh, magazine when they were in France. And so like their kind of camaraderie and how they think of like what um, journalism is or like what visualized thing journalism is about is also something that like was older than their collaboration in um, Al-Akhbar per se. 
So there was like the format also, the fact that it was a tabloid, uh, the use of photography in it. Like sometimes they would like use pictures upside down. They would like design yeah. graphics instead of pictures. They gave the, the they gave photography a huge base mm. that usually not all newspapers used to have. So I think yeah, the, I the think front that page was, was a full yeah uh, cover, a uh, full uh, photo a photo. Yeah, right. Yeah, many and times, he also designed the typeface, right? He, was he also designed the typefaces. Yeah, the mm. the like the display ones and the text ones. And he later on went to design uh, an Arabic jadid mm. uh, with Azmi Chari. And so that I mean that is also like an interesting. I think that it's like a more visually mature version of al Akhbar because mm. it came after and it has like more nuanced typography and and probably the budget was bigger because it was a Qatari newspaper so they were also able to mm. experiment more and uh, yeah so I think his, his work in journalism is really what he is seeing I, I for, think you you uh, weaved that book beautifully you weaved it I, I, I'm in one sitting I could I read it through from cover to cover, and it was beautifully written. Thank you for taking us into happy. that. Uh, thank you for taking us into that uh, journey with you and thank with you. Him. No, I just wanted to say that he's a very generous person, and I think a big part of what I was able to write was what he was able to share. Mm. I got to meet him last year, so uh, yeah, he was he was great too. Um, so if Funny. that was the project, you were very. Uh, proud of what is the project you most enjoyed doing or is it the same or is it a different one so i think i remember with a lot of you know a lot of joy in my heart the time that i was working with oman documentation and research and that i think that was between 2006 and 2008 when christine tommy had uh, put me in touch with luchman Slim at the time because he wanted to design some poster um, the, I think the late, that was for the, uh, the late Luchman's team. Mm. And, uh, and he was doing this project that was on a collection of photographs for the Jebdeni Cham massacre. And I remember working on a poster and catalog for that. And our collaboration went well, and then like other projects kept on coming. And I really love the time that I would spend there working because they had this, like the premises of Oman and right in the middle of Har Tahri. And it was always so many people coming and going and projects taking birth. And like, I met so many people there and, and I learned a lot and I learned a lot, especially, and I want to credit him because he was a master of the Arabic language. And so I learned a lot about the Arabic types, I think, from him as well. Such as? Like the difference between the Arabic brackets and the Latin brackets or like um, not leaving a space after Wabunatif. Yeah, and I also, because they ha because they were working on all these cultural projects, the, the posters that I would design with them would just be all over the city. Like I would go to sleep one night, wake up in the morning and it's like, oh, that's me. I did this, I did this. And <laughs> like, I remember having this like, pride in like the feeling of being part of this cultural fabric of the city. Yeah, that's very um, satisfactory, yeah. I bet. Yeah, 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 very much. Yeah, so, and I, I, they, the, the work that they did, like also, you know, they had this big archive that they were, they were trying to activate. So I think, although maybe I didn't understand the value of what they're doing as deeply as I would understand it now at the time, I still like knew that this was something that matters. The top Are thing. these the posters you told me once about that you saw in other movies? So one of, yeah, this is one of the, that I did with them in 2007, um, or I think 2007, they had this big exhibition that was called Missing, which they worked on in collaboration with um, the ICRC and like with the, the committees of the parents of the missing and they did this exhibition and we had like a poster that was um that was uh, promoting the exhibition 
Mm-hmm. And and so we did this project and then it toured for a couple of years. And that was that. But somehow I kept seeing this poster, like when I would go online to like, there would be an, um, like an article talking about the disappeared, you know, they would use that poster or like mm, a visual as a visual that poster. Mm. And then I saw this poster again in um, Eliana Rahib's movie Sleep Just Nights in 2012, which is the one where she brings a Shansha study in chasing one of the parents of the 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 disappeared in a conversation against the background of that exhibition. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, would you tell uh, our listeners who Asad Shaftari is? So Asad Shaftari is um, one of the many people who took part of the Lebanese war, mm. the civil war, and he's the first and probably the only person who ever came out and wrote like a mea culpa of sorts um, in the newspaper to say I'm guilty of doing this and that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, so the movie puts put the poster and and this like this is something that I understood later that what what this poster was doing is it was trying to adopt like the language of transition and justice which is like after the conflict we bring people together and we do reparations and everyone is happy sort of i'm kind of being maybe a bit sarcastic but it's like a language that is built on like victim perpetrator and we solve it with justice and what this movie did was use these posters as this background that is representing visual just like transitional justice and show that the real problem is not solved yet because there was here was this person who's you know could disappeared and here was this person who participated in the war and they're still not able to have that conversation because the rep like the the truth quote unquote is not out but also um, but also your work sort of and when designers think of when they are first commissioned to do a certain work, there's energy that is put into it. And mm-hmm. that energy is not dissipated. It doesn't go anywhere. You feel, we feel that it ends with the project. Yes. But at the yes. end of the day, you can see it coming back. And it's like energy yes. spent that is perpetual all the time. It's there. It, yes. it never yes. disappears. So as designers, I think the visuals we do come back to us or keep yes. on traveling without without us knowing where yes. it is going. So you, you might get yes. surprised that in 30 years time, somebody will use that poster again for something else that you did not intend for, right? Yes. Maybe. Yes. You never know. I mean, there's a poster now in the streets of Beirut with Diwan and Dakira, Lubnani, I don't know if you... But this one, like this one we designed in, I think, 2011, and it's still out there. They still print it every now and then. Mm. Um, so, yeah, yeah, thing, things come back. Mm. Definitely. That's nice. So, Definitely. do you think this is the project you got the most recognition for? No, I think in terms of recognition, um, Majun Design Studio, which I um, started with Khajag Apelian around 2010, um, is like the project that got me the most recognition. Um, so we, so I was doing my master's in Holland pretty much at the same time with Khajag, and we had worked together on the Mediamatic project, the Nord, that you had, uh, that we mentioned earlier in this uh, episode. And there was, we had like this dream of starting this entity that we kind of, stole this dream from Media Matic because they were doing all of these like commercial projects in parallel with these cultural projects. And so we came back wanting to sort of recreate that, but in design form. Mm. And I think we were a little, I don't know if naive, but definitely very optimistic about how much we could fund our cultural projects from our design world. <laughs> And, um, but I, I, it was still a very, you know, it was still a very rich time, I think, in terms of like, we, we were doing all of this design work, but we were also taking part of the design 
culture that was shaping in the city, like taking part of like the Beirut Design Weeks, hosting exhibitions. Uh, we hosted the lettering exhibition once and we and started the show lettering workshops with Christian Serkis at the time. So that felt, I think, besides the work that we were doing, that we were seeing around us, um, also this engagement and we were both teaching at the same time. So I think that that kind of created a constant feedback loop um, mm. that felt like recognition. And we also, like one of the projects that we worked on that keeps on um, giving until now, and we talked about how things that we designed come back. Uh, we worked for a long time, so it was kind of a long-term collaboration with Ashet Antoine, the publishers, and we uh, worked on all of these guidelines for like fiction theories, uh, non-fiction theories, historical stuff, uh, one-offs, you know. And so, like, we designed all of these templates that they're still using until today. And every time I go to... Uh, they're still very Kitab, fresh. Yeah, I see them everywhere. And everybody, I, I think there's a lot of people and designers who are trying to also uh, copy uh, some of the templates, um, uh, which is a good uh, uh, compliment, I, I would... Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think they did something um, like also because collaborations are about, you know, the two sides of things. And I said Antoine were a brilliant team of people working, um, all women, I must add. <laughs> um, and they really had this vision of things like and I remember like learning from them in terms of design as well, mm. um, like tricks with design or things like that. And we worked. Yeah, they, like they had this vision and uh, yeah, and that's why we were able to do this kind of work. And I, I do think they set the standard for other publishing houses at the time with the work we did together. It, it's, it looks like it's very clear for the listeners. Uh, there's a thread that's common in all your work and it's language and your love for language. I mean, from... Uh, Hachet Otwan, the la last one, to Umam, and your your uh, experience with uh, Lukman Slim, and then Emil yeah. Menaim's work with the editorial, and there's a lot of editorial and language that you're quite interested in and links all the work that you do. And now you're translating it into writing and research. Yeah. Which, um, so, mm, but yeah, I think this is... Do you find it difficult? Do you find it difficult? What do you find difficult in, in everything that you're doing? What is the most difficult uh, thing you face? I see difficult. Um, in a way, I think when I get comfortable in what I'm doing, I try to shake things up for myself a little bit. So I think the, like the, the research or the research project that I'm trying to do now as part of my PhD is difficult for me because it's not again my like design is my home um discipline so it's not necessarily what I'm good at but it's what I'm learning to do and I think mm -hmm. um I think the difficulty that I said to myself is always somehow something that I bring on to myself because I want to learn something new and evolve uh, but you're definitely right about my love for language. Um, and and it, it's somehow also translating into my uh, PhD research now because I'm trying to look at like the letter form in culture, like in, in what, why we're writing in the form that we're writing visually. Mm. Like, um, Can't wait for that. Yeah. I want to read oh, it. That's going to be a long, <laughs> long wife. <laughs> we can wait. We can wait. Why do you feel that what you do is important? I mean, where is the importance of what you do or designers do? And where do you feel you have a greater relevance? So I think I'm going to circle back to what you said about the fact that the, what, the things that we do come back to us somehow. And I think... Uh, like a lot of, like there was a time when I used to believe more in like 
big things and like big revolutions. And like, I wanted, you know, maybe I was hoping for the things that I do to like shake something. And I've come to believe more in accumulation. Um, so Bil I don't know that, yeah, build up. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, I don't know that what I, like one thing that I did would have this tremendous impact, but I'm hoping that the many things that I do, you know, get, make the world go round as it goes round somehow. <laughs> and how would you like to be remembered then? I mean, legacy is a big word, but in 30 years time, let's say. I mean, I'd like to say through my writings um, that people would find them useful or make, you know, enjoy reading them or make use of them in their own research. But also, you know, we were talking about finding inspiration in people and a lot of the people that I met along the way stay with me because they've taught me stuff. And I do hope that I'm able to give the same to others. Like if people, students or like people that I work with remember things that I taught them and that are useful for them, I think I'm happy enough. Mm -hmm. I'll be in my grave anyways, but <laughs> I wouldn't know. What do you imagine to be important in design in the next 10 to 20 years? We're now talking about AI. Uh, that's the new kid on the block. But apart from AI, well, I'll ask you about that later. What do you imagine will be important in design? Maybe in design education or the practice? So I think what's happening, like I don't know that, that I want to talk about how like design will change visually or in terms of profession. Um, but I think a lot of the conversations that, that we have about design now are different than the conversations we used to have like 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and In what way? And like we're much more inclined to think of our role in the profession to be like reflexive about what we're doing, about our place in the world, about the hybridity of culture, like what is local, what is not, how do we marry the two, are we ever able to split the two, um, they just like work together. I think, I think the, this heightened, you know, global, globalization that we're, we're seeing and like all of this movement is really making people be reflexive about their position uh, in relation to the work that they do. And maybe this is a conversation that was being had in like the towers of academia for a while now. But I think the fact that it's like dissipating into practice and now we're taking more responsibility toward our practice, I think that's an exciting thing. Uh, are you referring happening. here to colonial legacies in the region? Like that's one of the things that we need mm -hmm. to think of and that I think people, like students, are much more aware of than we were mm. when we were students um, a couple of decades ago. So I think, yeah, this, this just like this intentionality about the work that we do as designers. And it, it probably comes also with a certain empowerment, mm. you know, like when, when I graduated, people were just going and working for advertising agencies. They were not necessarily thinking about how they're taking part of the world as designers. Um, so I think, I think we're having more exciting conversations about design now than we were. And I am hoping and hopeful that we're going to keep on having more and more exciting conversations as we go. Just to wrap it up, any yeah. final word or thought you would like to leave us with? Um, I would just really like to thank you and Huda and Yasmin for making this project happen. I think it's, it takes a lot of effort and it's great that you're willing to do it for us. It's our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lara. Thank you, Lara Bala, for being with us. Yes, sir. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.